You know, it is a great uh, personal and professional privilege to be addressing you this afternoon. I'm honored to be here as the Fall 2008 Ellison Chair Distinguished Lecturer. And I stand in the shadow, literally, of the previous industry and academic leaders that have had this privilege, and I thank you for that. I am a uh, grateful and committed 17-year veteran of service to the industry, the American Nursery and Landscape Association, and its research counterpart, the Horticultural Research Institute. In my 35-year career as a professional trade association, I have worked for a, 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 a multiple industries, and my experience allows me to authoritatively state that this industry, which grows and distributes, retails, designs, installs, and maintains landscape and interior plants, is among the most fortunate of all industries. Its products and services are eagerly sought by over 80 million American households. The conduct of business in our industry is characterized by remarkable collaboration. First, among the industry businesses themselves and with a degree of harmony that is then reflected in its mostly happy family of trade and professional associations. And it enjoys a supportive and authentic trade press core that provides a credible communication network among the highly diversified interests in the industry. The industry is also aided and abetted by a competent and engaged research and extension community. Our land-grant universities and the USDA Agricultural Research Service are populated with scientists and other professionals that enjoy friendly and practical relationships with industry stakeholders. This relationship is nurtured by the financial support from industry foundations such as the Horticultural Research Institute, the American Floral Endowment, and others. And these organizations, coupled with the proceeds of the National Floriculture and Nursery Research Initiative and its turf grass counterpart, engender millions of dollars of research funding annually. All of this good fortune, notwithstanding, life in our industry and your academic pursuits is not without challenges. Some portending change that could extensively alter the traditions and the systems that we have enjoyed for multiple generations in this industry. It is on these challenges, and more importantly, the opportunities that they offer, that I would like to focus my remarks this afternoon. I am framing these remarks around three keys to future success in the industry. Pursuing a changing marketplace, embracing sustainability, and improving industry problem solving. My perspective on the changing marketplace is influenced by the ideas espoused by our colleague and friend here, Charlie Hall. Uh, he has become a bit of an industry oracle on this point, and I certainly emphasize the bit part, since he and I are both vertically challenged. But together, we make up in mental agility what we lack in physical stature, right, Charlie? And on my part, I make up in ignorance what I lack in advanced education. And with these qualifiers, let me identify some clear movement in three of our market's tectonic plates. The first is our nation's demographics. Research and common sense both attest that we are entering a period of diminishing numbers in our primary purchasing population cohort, that is, middle-aged households. And for the past 15 years, the industry has ridden on the back of a boomer behemoth, journeying through its most prosperous life period and exercising its prime buying habits of our industry's products and services. For the next decade or so, the industry is facing fewer people in this prime age group. And we're going to need to find ways to extend the boomers' interests 
and spending patterns through our offerings. And at the same time, we need to explore innovative ways at an earlier point to attract the interests of the larger cohort of Gen Yers as they transition into home buying. In all instances, we need to reverse an alarming trend of reducing the proportion of plant material relative to hardscaping in both residential and commercial design. The movement of a second tectonic plate started several decades ago, but it continues to cause major disruption in the industry's marketplace for woody plant material. I'm talking about the transition from field-grown to container-grown plants. And this shift has already converted the industry from a producer-driven to a buyer-driven marketplace. Containerized plants enable incremental buying and incremental delivery of plants. And this is a system that was largely unavailable when plants could only be seasonally harvested, the incremental part. And we are now witnessing the extended effect of this conversion to incremental buying and delivering and that is, the effect is the diminishing of traditional industry trade shows as a platform for active commerce. And this has significant implications for the industry's traditional method of financing its trade and professional associations. And these organizations are critical to defending and promoting our industry. Containerized plants also diminish the effect of major crop loss caused by acute weather crises and the enhanced portability of plant containers reduces episodic regional plant shortages that have historically protected plant product pricing. All of which leads to an opportunity to revolutionize our logistics and materials handling processes. The European industry clearly affirms the efficiency gains of standardized systems both in container sizing and shipping. While the greenhouse sector of our domestic industry has benefited from their example, the woody side has a long way to go in tapping these more efficient methods and their companion mechanization. To review then, actively pursuing the changing marketplace provides significant opportunities for our industry. One, to expand the leading and trailing edges of our residential customer base. Two, to consider how the network of critical trade associations are to be financed in the future, and three, to fully and quickly implement the lessons we have already learned about standardization, alternatives for more efficient logistics, and the need for more appealing packaging. Our second tectonic plate, or second major key to success is embracing sustainability. The term sustainability is increasingly appearing in our industry's conversations. At this point, it is invoked as both a blessing and a curse. And it's time for us to more fully pursue the concept, define its threats and opportunities, and in significant measure, I believe, declare industry ownership of its implications for us. The concept and full implementation implications demand more time than this lecture can provide. So let's engage in some shorthand talk. For our purposes today, the definition of sustainability is borrowed but authoritative. In essence, in its essence, sustainability is, quote, the ability to continue a defined behavior indefinitely. And in that sense, then, Sustainable practices become those practices that meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, sustainability is not a totally new concept. It was a fundamental principle of best practices for countless generations prior to the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution provided unprecedented opportunity to not just be stewards of Mother Nature's systems, but to potentially exploit their systems for shorter term gain. Embracing sustainability does not mean totally reverting back to pre-industrial revolution patterns. Instead, we have the opportunity 
and some would say the moral responsibility to marry our current post-revolutionary systems with the more traditional and enduring systems of stewardship. In practical terms, embracing sustainability means continuing many of the improved methods and systems that we are using today. It also means altering some of the behaviors that we are currently engaging in to bring them in line with a longer term framework that sustainability requires. And lastly, and perhaps to a lesser degree than some of the skeptics suggest, we need to discontinue some behaviors that clearly have brought us short-term advantage but are less essential to our current success than we believe. Further employing some shorthand, let me review the fundamental building blocks of sustainability and relate them to our industry. Before I do that, I want to pay homage to Dr. William McDonough. He's a noted architect former dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia, and is one of the foremost visionaries in articulating the benefits and necessities for grand scale conversion of industries and economies to sustainable practices. McDonough was a keynote speaker at the ANLA, that's our association's management clinic in the late 1990s. The clinic is a leading industry education event of some 1,000 horticulture business owners and senior management. And McDonough's presentation was the most intriguing I have witnessed in the 17 years of attending that event. The second most intriguing <coughs> presentation was his return visit to the ANLA Management Clinic in the year 2007. In the intervening years, McDonough became notable for his involvement in the development of the Hanover Principles in Germany in 2002. And these principles helped frame the sustainability movement worldwide. And these principles, more, uh, more recently, he has authored a book, Cradle to Cradle. Now the words in the book establish a manifesto to the business community to embrace sustainability. The book itself, physically is a tangible expression of the concepts he expresses in his book. And if you've not read it, I urge you to do so. In both his presentations to the industry at the management clinic, he made abundantly clear why our industry should be laying its own claim to sustainability and promoting its concepts to our customers and clients. Let me paraphrase now how and why I think what he said is so important to us. Again, in shorthand, the fundamental building blocks of sustainability could be labeled planet, people, and profits. The planet block is probably the best known element and is the subject of the most passion and skepticism expressed about the concept of sustainability. Perhaps much of the information relating to this building block is known to the audience here today. But in review then, McDonough speaks pointedly about how our natural systems produce waste, which in turn becomes food for some other living entity. Waste equals food. The total elimination of waste through biological metabolism was disrupted when the Industrial Revolution in instituted on a massive scale the production of waste products that don't become food and are not metabolized naturally. In his recent presentation at the clinic, McDonough told the poignant story of how his vision for a different approach was conceived. You see, as a child, he did what we all did. He played. And in that playtime, he would break something or complete a scribbling that he didn't want to keep. And upon inquiring of his mother what he should do with the broken pieces or that undervalued work of art, his mother told him to throw it away. And this is exactly what he did. And the next time it happened, his mother again instructed him to throw it away. 
And over and over that happened until one day he began to wonder what will happen when a way gets filled up. Now his thinking evolved to what is now a very compelling concept that encourages that we rethink how we do things to prevent a way from getting filled up. Now conventional thinking will typically lead to the assumption that he's talking about the need for more regulations to discourage businesses from producing more stuff to be thrown away into the air or into the water or buried in the soil. Au contraire. In his unconventional way, McDonough condemns regulation intended for such purposes. He believes that regulation is a system design failure. The presence of regulation is a sign of design failure. Regulation too often means simply restricting the output of failed design. In essence, the goal of regulation is for businesses to be less bad. Not good, mind you, but just less bad in producing unnatural waste. And of course, in the long run, such limiting of waste production only postpones the moment at which a way gets filled up. And in the meantime, regulation can have unintended consequences, such as limiting growth and profitability. McDonough is a strong proponent, proponent of growth and profitability. And I'm here to say that he is our friend for that very reason. And we need to listen to his solution. And that is to re-engineer the process of a, a, to, a, to eliminate waste as best as possible. Excess waste can be a system of excess inputs, a result of excess inputs. Disposing of waste can be very costly. In other words, his notion of sustainability can actually add to a business's bottom line. His thinking undermines the ideology behind more regulation and the theology of restricting growth and prosperity. His is a voice of reason. It is a third way for us to pursue while ignoring the stalemated argument between unbridled capitalists and gelded communitarians. So let us go forth and examine our systems which produce waste. Let's re-engineer, reuse, revert, and recycle like we never have before. The second building block of sustainability is people. This element also has its passionate defenders and its skeptics among our industry. As in the case of the changing marketplace, demographics are once again in the spotlight demanding our acknowledgement and adjustment. The supply of unskilled and semi-skilled laborers available to our industry is rapidly diminishing. The youngest baby boomer is now 44 years old. He's getting a little too creaky to perform the manual labor upon which much of our industry depends. Not only are there fewer native-borns in the younger adult cohort, but even fewer of them proportionately are willing to perform the tasks that we need performed in order to grow our plants, to get them to market, and to maintain them in the landscape. ANLA and our allied associations have spent over 10 years and well over a million dollars trying to convince federal legislators of the critical need to reform our nation's laws regarding immigration and guest worker programs, particularly those geared to meet the demand for seasonal unskilled labor. Now rest assured we're going to continue that battle until we win sufficiently to ensure a sustained and legal workforce for the future of our industry. But our system of labor allocation and, and work systems, are they sustainable under the circumstances, even if we get legislative relief? Many folks are beginning to believe that while absolutely necessary, functioning immigration and guest worker laws will not alone fulfill the people element 
of sustainable industry businesses. As with my previously cited case of logistics and materials handling opportunities, increased mechanization in multiple sectors of our industry is the best opportunity we have to address our labor challenges. And in that context, let me digress and offer a caution to any of you in the greenhouse sector here today who are seeking solace in the notion that the greenhouse sector is already mechanized. That may be truer in the plant production stages than in the case of your woody production counterparts. However, for those greenhouse and nursery growers who think they are in the business of growing plants, I've got news for them. They are not in the plant growing business. They are in the whole growing business. If they are not growing holes in their plant inventory on a continuous basis, they are out of business. And a critical ingredient in the whole growing business for growers is our current dependency on unskilled labor in our commercial landscape market and much of the residential market as well. Our industry today is far more interdependent than many folks in, the, in our industry appreciate. The end user customer does not, I repeat, does not make the distinctions of plant botany and production methods or annuals, perennials or woodies that, uh, the, that we make among ourselves. And for most of the market, and even more so for coming generations, this green stuff is all the same and is already intimidating enough even in their dummy version. The people part of sustainability also offers us a chance to rethink how we recruit and retain the skilled and management workforce as well. There's a lot of chatter going on about the mindset and work attitudes of the Generation Y worker now gaining presence in our workforce. These are the people between the ages of 18 and 30, and I see some of you are sitting up here in the back. For sure, a good chunk of what is being touted as different among you Gen Y workers is not so much fundamental as it is longitudinal. And by that I mean that as these workers spend more time in the workforce and their personal lives advance, some of their thinking will change and more likely resemble their older counterparts. Nevertheless, there are some opportunities for our industry to capture the imagination and even career commitment of these recent graduates. Our businesses remain very relationship-based. Our products and services offer a connection between people and the earth. Much of what we do is highly visual and stimulates the senses. There is tangibility and authenticity in time spent working in our industry. All of these features comport nicely with the instincts closely identified with you Generation Y sensibilities. And in short, there isn't much to apologize for in what we do in our work. And that's a definite plus, even to recently unemployed finance wizards from the Generation X cohort. The third building block of sustainability is profitability. And this is the trickiest of all. But it still offers some opportunities to rethink what we do. The first element has already been covered, which is reducing the cost of producing and eliminating some of the wastes we now generate and that reduction in waste can add to our bottom line, hence our profitability. But there is more, however. There is an emerging economic concept closely aligned with the sustainability movement that offers great promise to our industry. That concept is called ecosystem services. And while this idea may be familiar to many of you, it is virtually unknown in the broader industry community. As I apply the concept here, Ecosystem services identifies the benefits of natural systems that most cost-benefit analyses ignore or take for granted. Components of the ecosystem 
actually perform services of provisioning, as in food and water production, regulating, as in climate and diseases, supporting, as in nutrient cycles or pollination, and preserving, as in species diversity. And currently, there is little or no consideration of the economic value of these natural and invisible services when applying cost-benefit analyses to proposed residential or commercial and industrial development proposals. The reduction or loss of these natural services must begin to be factored into determining the true cost of further development and industrialization. And for sure, we're all concerned about the costs associated with the loss of ecosystem services. But, our but for our industry's purposes, I am much more concerned, much more concerned about the virtue of maintaining and expanding the benefits of these ecosystem services. By this I mean there are clear and significant opportunities for our industry to promote the value of the ecosystem services provided by the managed environment. What am I talking about? Green roofs, buffer plantings to filter or absorb water runoff, strategically planted trees to reduce ambient temperature or block frigid winds, using plants to clean up urban brownfields. What do we do now with toxic soil? We scoop it up and what do we do? We throw it away. And on and on. Now determining the full economic value of the ecosystem services as well as the environmental benefits of same of managed landscapes can occupy the attention of horticultural researchers and industry marketers for the next decade or more. And darn if we might not improve in our profitability in the process. In the early years of the horticulture industry, our energies and focus were largely concentrated on landscaping the estates and parks of major cities and providing the fruit trees and the windbreaks needed in rural America. Full flowering of the GI Bill following World War II and the birthing of the baby boomers, like me, ushered in an era of unprecedented growth in our industry. Suburbia was born, do-it-yourself gardening and landscaping replaced the estate gardener. A visionary named Walt Disney somehow came up with the idea of rendering his cartoon characters in brightly colored flowering plants and it was morning in our industry. And then in the late 60s and throughout the 70s, the interstate highway system was built and Lady Bird Johnson, a favorite daughter of Texas and our industry's patron saint, I might add, promoted the idea of landscaping along those highways. The 80s saw the expansion of office parks, shopping malls, and townhouse developments, all extensively landscaped and the commercial landscape maintenance sector was invented to meet the demand. Now those boomers around which most of those expansionist activities were focused are topping out. But we have a new opportunity before us yet again. Greening the last unplanted frontier of the managed landscape. Greening the last frontier uh, unplanted frontier of the managed landscape, and that is urban America. What do we need to do as an industry to clone Chicago Mayor Daley and elect them to leadership in every major city in America? The Windy City model, still it to be expanded on home ground, can mean so much opportunity in our industry. That opportunity in the next decade or so can tide us over while we wait for the echo baby boom generation, now unfolding, to reach maturity and grow our residential market again. One very promising development in this effort to green the cities is unfolding only two hours away from here, from College Station and nearby Austin. The Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, in collaboration with the American Society of Landscape Architects and the U.S. Botanical Garden in Washington, D.C., are heading a project called the Sustainable Sites Initiative, or SSI. 
This project is developing a set of guidelines and rating criteria for landscaping that parallels the successful LEED program of the U.S. Green Building Council. While the LEED program has some criteria for landscaping surrounding the buildings built to green building standards, those components of the landscaping criteria are pretty inadequate. And there are early indications that the U.S. Green Building Council would be interested in assimilating the SSI guidelines and criteria and rating components into future revisions of the LEED Green Building Certification Program. If that happens, if they assimilate the ratings and criteria and guidelines of this Sustainable Sites Initiative, the implications for our industry are significant indeed. An often heard lament in our industry is that landscaping is an afterthought to too many developers and uh, both commercial and residential plans. Instead of being included in the, additional, in the initial design and budgeting, landscaping is delayed or reduced in response to cost and time overruns. Construction techniques exacerbate already problematic sites. Wouldn't it be wonderful, the thinking goes, if quality landscaping were mandatory in the development process and our industry professionals were included in the deliberations at the beginning of the development process, wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, the dream is about to become a reality. If this Sustainable Sites Initiative proves successful, developers and builders seeking LEED certification for their projects will be forced, forced, to include quality landscaping in their plans and construction budgets. And landscape professionals will have a seat at the table and the budgets will be reworked to accommodate implementation of that landscape plan or the buildings would fail to be certified. There's a companion effort unfolding that complements the opportunities emerging from the definition of ecosystem services and the design of lead type criteria for landscaping. That effort is being spearheaded by an entrepreneurial venture in Raleigh, North Carolina. And ANLA endorses this, invent, uh, 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 this venture and we have supported it and collaborated with them for over four years. 18 months ago, a third player surfaced in the form of an insurance broker in New York City. So we have this entrepreneurial firm in Raleigh, North Carolina. We have the American Nursery and Landscape Association in Washington, D.C. And as of 18 months ago, we had an insurance broker join us from New York City. And the upshot of this collaboration is a fledgling but very promising endeavor to what? To monetize the value of landscaping. Monetize the value of landscaping. And if successful, this project can have major long-term effect on the scale and levels of commercial, residential, and municipal investment in landscaping. The Raleigh-based firm Horticultural Asset Management, Inc. has built, for the first time ever, a comprehensive database of wholesale pricing of multiple sizes of hundreds of varieties of landscape plants. This database now includes over 200 growers nationwide providing pricing. This company can therefore quote the catalog value of some 750,000 varieties and sizes of plants. The insurance broker in New York has been working with an insurance company and related underwriters who have accepted the validity of these plant prices. And the result is a first ever capacity to fully insure at the replacement value landscape plants, both in the production stages as crop insurance and in the installed landscape as a rider on a homeowner's policy. The private sector crop insurance program I'm talking about can be secured for greenhouse, field grown, and container grown plant material. It can be customized in terms of deductibles and the crops chosen to be insured against acute weather crises, as well as fire, and in the case of greenhouse, building collapse. And in the installed landscape, 
formulation, this insurance coverage provides for increasing coverage based on this increasing value of landscape plants over time. That's the significance of a database that not only includes plants, but includes the prices of plants of various sizes. And this is significant because it confirms the long-held claim that landscaping is the only component of the urban and residential in in infrastructure that increases over time. Let me say that again. Landscaping is the only component of the urban and residential infrastructure that actually increases in value over time. Let me illustrate what I mean. The homeowner only buys that expensive wolf cooktop for the trophy kitchen. And in three years' time, it is an obsolete model and it loses value. The homeowner only buys that expensive shower system for the trophy bathroom. In three years' time, several of the 200 water jets become clogged and the shower system has lost value. On the other hand, in the same three-year period, a landscape in which the homeowner invests is worth more than it was when it was brand new. And in six years' time, that investment will continue to grow while the homeowner goes out to buy a newer model cooktop or shower system. And once this concept of monetizing the, land, the value of landscape gains credibility and landscaping is defined as an investment in an increasing asset, the implications for our industry grow increasingly favorable. Where? Well, for starters, in the marketplace, where upgrading landscaping finds favor, and home builders can ensure upsell landscape packages for new homeowners. Where else? How about municipal governments and water purveyors on, uh, who have to justify why draconian water restrictions on landscaping are a wise move? With the landscape monetized, we can make the case that overly restricted wa restrictive watering requirements lead to plant stress and failure, affecting millions of dollars of investment in public and private landscapes. Besides, if you can't water it now, you can't hug it later. Now, perhaps I'm a hopeless optimist when I tell you that I believe that embracing sustainability can be the most significant and favorable development this industry has seen since the GI Bill, highway beautification, or the concept of the office park. Such an embrace is not without risks. For example, a full embrace means joining forces with some environmental advocates that we have regarded as adversaries in the past. These folks have seen some things coming that we have not had the time or energy to focus upon. And some of the proposals to advance sustainability will require increased use of native plants. The Sustainable Sites Initiative criteria are certain to include credits for the appropriate use of native plants. Now to some, even many in the industry, this will be viewed as a downside. To them, I would offer an alternative interpretation. If the SSI is adopted as part of the lead criteria for green building certification, and 20% of all buildings are built according to these criteria, then this constitutes an increasing, predictable, and consistent market for native plant material. This, this will mean that we have a viable commercial opportunity for growers who want to work in this market. It seems far better, to me anyway, that we cooperate and promote that market, resulting in raising legitimate demand for native plants, rather than ignoring or fighting the development and end up with regulation on what we can grow and no industry-induced demand for those plants by our customers. Now, beyond pursuing changing marketplace and embracing sustainability, 
there's a third key to the future success of the green industry. Part of my professional life includes spending time with fellow association executives who lead trade associations in other industries. These industries range from energy producers to healthcare to construction and even snack foods and bottled water. And following our, our discussions about the respective industries we serve, I invariably conclude that our green industry is uniquely blessed. That conclusion accounts in part for why I'm still here after 17 years rather than conforming to the average tenure of five to seven years for CEOs in my field of work. Now, as I stated earlier, this industry has a lot going for it, congeniality and appealing products, and along with that is a white hat reputation in the eyes of the public and most government decision makers. We also have been fortunate to ride the wave of market building forces beyond our industry, such as decades long uh, booms in home building and road construction and commercial development. And there are plenty of examples in all that where we have made our own good luck happen as well. But we mustn't let all this good fortune make us complacent. There are big things coming that could present us with unparalleled problems. And we need to beef up our industry's problem solving capacities before the full spectrum of these potential problems becomes more reality than we can handle. Among the potential problems we are the following, increased regulation and financing industry research and development. Regardless of who wins the presidential election next month, there is bound to be an increase in the amount of regulations that will affect our industry's businesses. There are plenty of legitimate examples of the failure of government to engage in the kind of preventive regulatory measures that is an acceptable and even necessary role for government. I would make a distinction. I would make a distinction between the preventative regulation that I'm talking about and the kind of curative regulation or corrective regulation that Bill McDonough refers to in his premises on sustainability. While there are some people who disparage any kind of government intervention in the conduct of business, most of us, whether we're liberals or conservatives, conservatives can agree that reasonable measures controlling the scope and influence of the bad actors, bad actors that are invariably found in every industry, uh, any kinds of controls against those, as long as they are reasonable, are good for the good guys in the industry and for their customers. That said, behind every well-intentioned law or regulation lurk some unintended consequences. And the probability of those unintended consequences is directly proportional, directly proportional to the amount of double-mindedness present in the crafting of that law as well as the incompetency of the civil servants tasked with implementing lousy law in the form of dysfunctional regulation. And a glaring example of what I'm talking about is the current state of the nation's immigration laws. We have other troubling examples as grand as oversight of our financial markets or as mundane as just getting through the security lines in our national airports. But we are entering a cycle of re-regulation, and there is much about the way our industry does things that are fodder for the ruminating government authorities. And we simply must be prepared to make good arguments on behalf based on reliable facts and quality research. There was a time when claiming sizable business losses was good defense against regulation. Well, that time is gone. And our defense must now be built on hard data communicated by industry business owners in their terms with authentic examples and done so repeatedly. Such defense will require more research and understanding than we currently enjoy. And added to this regulatory demand is globalization and in the importing of pests and diseases for plants. Now this audience knows better than I do what challenges face us all in securing and financing additional research dollars that are so necessary. And it has been good to have the extensive long-term federal and state underwriting of our industry's research and de development. But despite all the good such third-party funding has provided over the years, it has come with a hidden risk. And that is that our industry's products are not priced to include the necessary expenses associated with privately funded research and development. 
And this lack of an R&D funding infrastructure is exacerbated in a cottage industry like ours. We don't have an Eli Lilly's or a 3M company to keep the little guys afloat by underwriting industry research. And with government funding shrinking and agricultural's political base reduced to 2% of the population, we need to figure out how to stretch finite funding farther and engender new sources of financing research. Now, ANLA and HRI are seeking ways to innovate in our fundraising and funding methods to enhance the industry's capacity for problem solving. We welcome your ideas and suggestions because increasing our problem solving capacity is a third and very important key to the future success of the industry. In summary then, I see at least three keys to our industry's future success. These endeavors are achievable provided we build on the strong foundation of collaboration that has brought this remarkable industry to its current level of success. I applaud Texas A&M and the generous donors who have underwritten establishment of the Ellison Chair, their vision beginning with Ellen and Jim, and supported by countless others, produces opportunities like this one today. I hope I have stirred some thinking on your part about the future of the nursery and greenhouse industry, how the marketplace needs to be pursued in new ways how embracing sustainability can open new and exciting opportunities for our industry to grow and prosper. And finally, the necessity for us to build our capacity to solve industry problems while they are still solvable. Together we can nurture these keys to our future success. And our failure to do so will mean lost opportunities, diminished resources, and the need to relearn lessons we already know. The second kick of a mule contains no education. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>